When a newborn baby looks out a window, what does it see? It has no apparatus by which to clump together an infinite number of details, package that clump, and dismiss it. It cannot instantly combine vein, leaf, stem, twig, branch, bough, bark, gnarl, root into a single dismissive word, tree. Even each of the component words, vein, leaf, stem, compacts an infinity of details into a single dismissive concept. What it sees then, what the baby sees then, must be an infinitely various, constantly shifting, kaleidoscopically colored field trying to encompass such a vision would drive adults crazy. They must exclude most of it, reduce the rest of it, and organize that reduction into identities they can name. The baby has no such necessity. It has not yet been separated from the world. It is what it sees, infinity. Adults are separated by what they see. What they see is the seen, and they are the seer. Unless they can reduce what they see to something they can encompass, it will overwhelm and encompass them. What enables them to see will blind them. There's no alternative. Language separates the inseparable into parts, confers identity on each part of the whole, gives that part a name, and each name holds the rest of infinity at bay. What a tremendous, profitable, necessary instrument language is. It enables us to pit our bounded intelligence against the boundless universe. Wow, huh? Leonard Rubinstein my favorite college professor. One of my mentors, the one who basically taught me how to think. The man who once looked at me after I made a joke and shook his head and said, Martin, you have so much sarcastic wit in you. I'm not sure you should lead a congregation. <laughs> he was right, I did have to learn to behave. He was this immense intellect. Sitting him was like sitting with Socrates. One time I had written this story in class, and all of us inspiring writers, we'd sit there in class and we'd rip each other's stories to shreds to help each other. And he said, what do you think of Martine's story? And I was appalled when my first classmate said, well, I was shocked. And another said, Mike, you seem like a nice guy. I didn't know you were like this. And then another one said, it's just so stereotypically racist. And, and honestly, I was like a deer in the headlights. How could I have messed up so badly? And Rubenstein, he just let the comments come and come. He said, okay, who else, who else, who else? And finally, after about 10 minutes, 10 minutes where I felt like I should be incarcerated, Rubenstein said, this is what I wrote on Martine's story. A remarkable achievement. The author manages to convincingly portray the sin of his main character, demonstrating without apology the racism of the man, and then through the telling of an entirely believable religious experience, invokes upon that character the corrective justice of God. The story recalls a sense of a parable of Christ. By the way, nicest thing anybody ever said to me. And the class was reminded that they had read a little too quickly and judged a little too quickly. They had missed the point. But there was another time with Dr. Rubenstein. You see, he was my advisor. This was an earlier time, and another assignment had not gone well for me. No, not at all. And of course, he knew I was going to be a pastor. And after what was a pretty re brutal review of my work, he said, Are you okay? And I said, No. I was not okay. Life had been pretty rotten lately, really rotten. And I had this feeling that God was punishing me, punishing me for not being the kind of follower I should be. 
Wow, he said. Martine, I didn't know you were superstitious. What? I said. You think you're in control of God, he said. You think your actions control God? You think God is like a big slot machine in the sky when you put the right coins in, good fortune pours out? Of course not, I said. Then stop living like that. Controlling God by how you live, that's superstition, Martine. That's not faith. Life is hard, but God always loves. It was about a year, six months really, before she got sick. You've heard me talk about my grandma, who suffered a massive stroke at 58. She was the rock of our family, never to be quite the same again. It was before Christmas, and my mom said, Grandma wants us to go and take the presents to all the cousins. We need to go to her house. So we went, and we went down to the basement, and it was full. And I realized, as long as I had been alive, I'd always gotten as many, if not more, presents from my grandma at Christmas as I had gotten from my parents. And the legitimate concern for, hey, no one needs that much stuff aside, for this was a sin of that era, I was just overwhelmed at suddenly seeing the magnitude of what I received multiplied by my seven cousins. And later my mom told me, when Grandma went to work, she went with the understanding, with my grandfather, that what she earned at work was hers, and that she was going to spend it on her children. Remember Cary Grant? Kids, you don't remember Cary Grant. <laughs> he was this awesome, awesome actor who built this persona of this simultaneously incredibly handsome and cool guy who somehow didn't get that he was so incredibly handsome and cool, so he acted like a regular guy. Cary Grant, later in his life, admitted he wasn't just an actor on screen, but off screen as well. He admitted that he had thought deeply about what a suave, sophisticated, yet self-effacing guy would be like. And then he practiced being that guy, and he practiced it, and he practiced it until that guy was him. He once famously said, everyone wants to be Cary Grant. Heck, I want to be Cary Grant. So here's the deal. We are talking about witnessing again today. And in many ways, learning to witness for Jesus, it's learning to become like Jesus so that Jesus shines through you. And I've given you some people in my life that showed me how to become that person, and it's a journey that is far from finished, believe me. What has Cary Grant got to do with it? Well, aside from the obvious physical resemblance. <laughs> All right, I'm just seeing if you're paying attention. <laughs> Give me a minute on that one. Far more of our lives are a matter of manufacture creation that, than we care to admit. Recent and not so recent studies on gender, for example, show us this. What a man is, is largely a matter of what learning from those around us, what is expected of a man. Likewise with a woman. And we've only recently started to listen to the fact that historically, historically we've always, always had people who knew they didn't fit into those specific culturally defined roles. It's just not that simple. Even though for some of us it is. And if you need more proof on this, look into history and you'll find that these roles are not the same for all cultures but rather defined by culture. But my point is this. We learn to become who we become because we observe. We observe those around us, how they handle relationships, how they respond in a crisis, how they show love and anger, disappointment. We learn from the witness of others. We have to. We need help learning whom we should become. And it's only bad when we say it can only be one way. 
My grandma taught me faith and selflessness. She taught me the joy of living more concerned about others than yourself. My professor taught me to stop putting God into my own, my own little box and to realize that language, even as it is an incredible gift and an instrument of great beauty, is limited. Just as the word tree instantly combines vein, leaf, stem, twig, branch, etc., into an incomplete and dismissive little word, tree. So talk about God, even the word of God, cannot completely communicate the immensity and beauty of God. Language is always symbolic, an approximation. It cannot can contain in its structure such mystery. And while Cary Grant taught me less than they did, his lesson is we can, in so many ways, become the people we would choose to be. It's never going to be perfect, but the journey to choosing and becoming who we want to be as people, it's real. There's somebody in your life, hopefully there's a bunch of somebodies, who witness to you how to live, how to live in faith. Think about those people. How do they do it? How do they do it right? How do they treat others? How are they a positive influence in their church or in their town? How do you feel when you are with them? Loved? How do they make you feel that way? What can you learn from their witness? I can tell you one thing about those people. We need more of them. Many more. So that the mission of God, the gospel mission, can get completed. Gandhi famously said, be the change you want to see in the world. What that means is become the person the world needs, the person you want to become. Of course, it'll never be perfect. There is this thing out there called sin. But we have been given witnesses and a call to try. We have been given a witness named Jesus and the promise that his spirit, the Holy Spirit, will join us on the journey.